السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على آله وصحبه ومن والاه. First of all, I want to thank the organizers and I want to thank everyone that came out here in the heat. May Allah reward you all. Thank you for coming. Especially the fact that it's not just people here from India, alhamdulillah. When one part of our ummah hurts, the whole ummah has to hurt. When we're talking about our brothers and sisters in India, I want everyone to take a moment and just appreciate that we are talking about over one-tenth of our ummah. Over one-tenth of our ummah lives in India. Over one-tenth of our ummah is at risk of genocide. Over one-tenth of this house that the Prophet ﷺ called us to, this house of Islam, is under threat of genocide. And if Modi and the fascists thought that they could target one-tenth of our ummah with genocide and not hear from the rest of the ummah, they are wrong. Are they not wrong? Yes. All of you are a part of that testimony that they are wrong. Yes. That it's, not, it's not just Indian Muslims that are suffering. It's Muslims as a whole that are standing with them. And it's not just Muslims that are here, by the way, it's also people of conscience, people of some level of moral consistency, human beings that understand that what is happening in India is a threat to humanity because genocide affects the entire, the entire world order that we have, the entire structure that we supposedly have, the entire human rights value system that we supposedly adhere to, all of it is impacted when you have over 200 million people that are living under threat of genocide. And so we are one ummah and we are standing together with our brothers and sisters today. And I think that it's been repeated over and over again, but it should be said that when we talk about the RSS, we are talking about the child of Nazism that continues to rear its ugly head on this earth. We are talking about people that are proud of their fascism. We are talking about a shameless ideology, a hateful ideology. And there's a reason why Modi was called the butcher of Gujarat. And there's a reason why he was once banned from this country. What changed? What changed to where suddenly he could come into this country and you have a whole Howdy Modi rally in Texas where he's welcomed not just by a shameless president Donald Trump, by, but, but by many Republicans and Democrats. What changed? What changed to where now a man who once could not even enter this country could address Congress? What changed to where Barack Obama wrote the introduction for Modi, reformer in chief in the Time 100? What changed for President Joe Biden to do the exact same thing? What has changed about this man? Nothing has changed except that we cannot expect politicians, Muslim or otherwise, Republican or Democrat, to have any level of moral consistency. Their status quo is moral bankruptcy. Our status quo can't be that. So we have to be that consistent voice when our leaders fail us, when our representatives fail us, when those who claim to be for human rights continue to be the greatest enablers of human rights violations. And yes, I'm talking about the American government, Republican and Democrat. We have to be that morally consistent voice. We have to be that voice that comes together always and says we will not stand for it. We will not stand for the genocide of our brothers and sisters. We will raise our voices for them. We will hold elected officials accountable. We will hold corporations accountable when they deal with a fascist regime. And we will continue to tell Modi, who's a wannabe Hitler, that you are a coward. That you are that you are not welcome in Texas. No. And, that, and that this group of people, and we're not the only group of people, but people of conscience, and the ummah around the world will stand up to your tyranny, and we will not be silenced in the face of a genocide, an attempted genocide of over 200 million of our brothers and sisters. And by the way, dear brothers and sisters, I say this particularly as a Palestinian as well, that our solidarity is one, we are united by the bulldozer, but more than that, we are united by the brotherhood of Islam and the brotherhood of our struggle. We are one with you. And there is no, there, 
there should be no separating between those causes. We have to understand that they're not they're not seeing us as separate beings, they're dehumanizing us collectively. And so when we don't stand collectively, then we accept their prism. We accept their separation of us when we don't stand collectively in solidarity. India and Israel apply the exact same tactics of dehumanization. India calls it the Citizenship Act, Israel calls it the Jewish nation state law. India says very openly that it wants to apply an Israeli model. I'm not making this up. 2019, wasn't it the India Council General who said that India should consider the Israel model? Well, if you consider the Israel model, then expect the Palestinian resistance. Expect that spirit to to come up. Because we have Razan, Najjar in Palestine, and we have Afrin, and we have Muskan in India. We We have people of courage and people of bravery. People who do not fear you that will stand up to you and we will stand with them as they stand up to you. We know we're comfortable over here. We know that it's very easy for us to raise our voices over here. But we are inspired by those young people that are raising their voices over there. And we stand with them. And when the Prophet ﷺ says that Allahu mawlana wa la mawla lakum Allah is our protector, you have no protector. That our dead are in paradise. When we think about mudathir, and Sahil, our dead are in paradise, bidnillahi ta'ala, God willing, they are in paradise, inshallah ta'ala. That allows us to consistently stand up with our brothers and sisters and lend our voices to theirs and to let them know that we're inspired by them and to let them know that they have our voice. And when they use these terms, dear brothers and sisters, you have to check them on their hypocrisy. I know that it can be exhausting to check them on their hypocrisy. I know that it can be exhausting to protest over and over again. I know it can be exhausting to organize for so many different causes at the same time. But we have to understand it's the same playbook and that this is a moment of urgency. And so when they when they say that we're opening transit camps, we call it and we say, no, those are concentration camps. Just like when China says we're opening re-education camps, we say no, those are concentration camps for our Uyghur brothers and sisters. We have to be that consistent moral voice and then call every immoral hypocrite on it, whether they sit in office here or whether they prize Mondi with a gold medal in the Muslim world. They don't represent us. That's right. They don't represent us. We stand with our brothers and sisters. And so dear brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you all for coming out. And I want to leave with leave you with one more thing. You know, they always reach this point where they get to the insults of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I want you to think about this. When India insults the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when the regime insults the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that is an exercise of dominance over its Muslim population, or so they think. Just like when Israeli settlers march in Al-Aqsa and they chant that the Prophet ﷺ is dead and they insult the Prophet ﷺ. It's an exercise of so-called dominance. Just like when France does the same thing to its disenfranchised Muslim population. It's an exercise of dominance over its Muslim population. Here's what they don't understand and what they will fail every single time to understand. The more they insult our Prophet ﷺ, the more they increase his honor and his love in our hearts. The more that they chant that the Prophet Muhammad is dead, the more that we remind them that the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad is alive and well. And we will continue to resist them. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.